Good afternoon. Welcome. For those I have not met, I am Daniel Johannes. I'm the CEO of the Millennium Charting Corporation. It's good to see you all this afternoon. So this afternoon, we're going to be talking about Malawi and Mali. It's going to be moderated by Chuck Cooper, our Vice President for Congressional and Public Affairs. Uh, so Chuck, nice to see you again. And I will now give you very briefly about some of my activities since we met here last March and talk about also what was discussed at the board meeting last week. So first, let me talk about my trip to Zambia. In May, we added Zambia as the new member of the Millennium China Incorporation family. And I was in Lusaka to sign a $355 million compact with the Republic of Zambia. And the entire $355 million is concentrated in water to help the country become more water secure. Uh, and especially in Lusaka, where we are concentrating our projects. Um, the water system today in Lusaka was built some 40 years ago when the inhabitants of Lusaka were only about 250,000 people. Well, today, Lusaka has over a million people, and they have not been able to distribute water effectively and efficiently. If you live in Lusaka, you get water once a week, if you'd like it, or maybe once every two weeks. So you have to do a lot of storage in order to uh, use water. So our compact eventually is going to be able to help the citizens of the country. We expect after it's completed, about a million two people would benefit from our investment. And uh, of course, uh, with that, you create a very healthy uh, uh, workforce that's free from any kind of waterborne diseases and also create a best environment for businesses. So I think it's going to be a win-win in Zambia. And then at the beginning of June, I went to Jordan and uh, Morocco. Um, Jordan also, we have a $275 investment in the water sector, uh, primarily invested in Zarqa, which is the second largest city in Jordan. And once that compact is completed as well, that about 3 million people will benefit from our investment. And let me talk about our investment in Jordan. Even though it's, it's about $275 million, it has three components to it. The first component is really designed to rehabilitate the current water uh, distribution uh, by fixing many of the leaks. Uh, approximately, we lose about 50% of the water today because it leaks everywhere. The second component is primarily to hook up additional 19,000 households to the current sewage system. We're also going to be rehabilitating that system as well. The third component is going to be primarily invested in the wastewater treatment plant in Zarka. That's where we're going to be able to leverage our investment by partnering with a private sector. In fact, when I was in Jordan, I was able to witness the signing of a $183 million uh, uh, agreement between the government, the banks, and the private sector consortium that's going to be managing the plan for the next 25 years. So it's great to see that our investments are going to be leveraged with investment from the private sector. And also, when I was in Jordan, I was able to go and see some of the beneficiaries that would benefit from our investment. And if you happen to live in Amman, also you get water once a week, but they have large containers that would help them uh, for one week. And if you happen to go to places where we're going to be working, in Zarka and other places, you're going to be collecting water in plastic containers. That's what I saw. I went to this house. Um, you know, uh, the beneficiary, her name was uh, Fatima Ali. And F Fatima is collecting water that will last her for one week. But you know what? She's been using plastic containers that have been previously used for paint. And when I was there, you know, she's doing a very good job, but I saw old paints floating around the water, which is not very healthy. And I went to another house next to it. The uh, last name also t happens to be Ali, but they're not related. I saw the same thing. So once our projects are completed, hopefully water flows every day instead of once a week. And people like Farma hopefully will be able to get water, clean water, that is, and not the kind of water she collects today. And also, I walked around the neighborhood. I saw raw sewage everywhere, and kids were playing everywhere. You know, Again, that's not healthy, and our investment's going to be able to help that. So again, uh, Jordan is going extremely well, and I met with our management team there, and I am 100% confident 
that our investment in Georgia is going to be able to be complete ahead of schedule because we have a great team and we have great partner uh, with Georgia. And then I went to Morocco. Morocco is a different story. Um, the compact was signed five, six years ago. It is for $700 million. And it is invested in many different sectors uh, throughout the country, and it entered to force much quicker than it should. In other words, many of the due diligence work was not done early on. It was done after the compact entered to force. Having said that, I, I believe that our teams, both here at home and in Morocco, are doing an outstanding job in trying to get the compact completed before September, when it had to be completed. And I met with the head of the government, with many of the ministers who are 100% committed to make sure that the compacts are completed, or the projects are completed, I must say. And if, in fact, it's not completed, then they have agreed to uh, complete the project using the Moroccan funds. So this is the kind of partnership we expect from our partners. And I came home extremely pleased where we are and also to see the kind of commitment we have both in Morocco and Jordan. Now, what have we learned from Morocco? Well, what we learned today is, number one, a lot of the compacts that were signed in the last three years, whether it be Zambia or Malawi and other places, it is pretty much sector specific and also concentrated in a few geography area. And many of the work, the preparatory work, the due diligence is completed ahead of time before it to force, which means it provides a lot of time for our partners to do the work on a timely basis. So it is the beauty of MCC. We have flexible to adjust, correct, modify to make sure that our work is having a tremendous impact with our partner countries. So it was a great visit. I came home again very pleased knowing that we have great partners and also that our investments are going to help many of our constituencies in uh, the country. Now let me take you about the board meeting last week. Uh, we have, there were two countries that were discussed, Mali and Malawi. One is a happy ending, the other one is a very sad story. The compact with Malawi was signed some 18 months ago. And because of declining um, transport and democratic and um, economic governance, first we put the, the compact on hold. And things were not getting better, so finally I recommended the board that it be suspended. So the board concurred with my recommendation and they made a decision to suspend the compact last March. Thence, it was formally suspended. There were events that took place. Number one, uh, President Mutharika uh, suddenly passed away, and Vice President uh, Joyce Banda uh, took the presidency, and the transfer of power was seamless, orderly, and uh, we were very proud of in terms of uh, how it happened. And uh, under President Banda, she was able uh, to take very courageous and bold moves to reverse many of the uh, democratic and, and de economic governance uh, that were sliding uh, before, and she was able to address our concerns, the concerns of other donors, the concern of other multilateral institutions, and frankly, the concerns of her own constituencies in Malawi. There's been dramatic, dramatic changes, which you're going to hear from the experts in a few minutes. So I went to the board recommending that we should lift the suspension and rescind the compact, and the board unanimously voted to do that. And uh, also, in the last 90 days, I have spoken to President Banda myself three times, and I tell you that I was extremely impressed. It's not about her. It is about the country, and this is the kind of partner you want to have. So, and uh, I'm going to be there in about two weeks with our technical experts uh, to support our decisions, and it's also a great compact. It is also $350 million, pretty much concentrated in the power sector to help that country become water, I mean, <laughs> power secure. We have a lot of water projects. Um, so, um, it's going to have a tremendous benefit uh, to her constituencies as well. So it is a dramatic move, the kind of movie you expect 
from a great partner and I trust what she's doing and I believe that we have a great partner in Malawi under President Banda. So I'm really excited about the trends that have taken place. But you're going to hear more about it from the, the panel. Mali is a sad case. Um, I was there last year. And you know, Mali, we have a $460 million compact concentrated in two sectors, agriculture and the expansion of the Bamako Airport. This compact was six months away from being completed when the coup happened last March. A sad case because the progress that would be made was just phenomenal. It was not an easy compact. Mali is not a rich country. As you know, that's why we're there. They did have some capacity issues at the beginning, but they were doing an outstanding job. Then you had, um, the officers who decided to overthrow the legitimate government of President Toure. Of course, when that happens, we cannot work with uh, countries that do not abide by the commitment in which they signed to become partner in the first place. So I recommended the board to terminate the compact in an orderly way, effective August 31st. Now, the agriculture part was pretty much complete when the board made a decision to terminate. The airport is a different story, um, and then you hear more about it from Jonathan Bloom, who is our deputy vice president for that area. The team is working hard, trying to do it responsibly and quickly to make sure that American taxpayer funds is preserved and protected. But it is a sad story. Since the coup d'etat happened, the country is divided into, into two, and frankly, we are concerned about the future of the people of Mali. And we join the rest of US government in calling for a full and quick restoration of constitutional civilian rule. Um, because really, it's a sad story. So with that, you're going to hear more from Jonathan Bloom. Again, we have a lot today. But I'll stop here and take your questions. Not Chuck, it's yours, all right? Take care, thank you. Oh, I have one question up there. Can you speak louder? Thank you. Sorry, uh, so this was uh, with regards to uh, your comments on Mali and the progress that was being made and the unfortunate overthrow of the government. Uh, I'm sure there are concerns about the fact that this will affect the people that have nothing to do with the overthrow and are trying to make a living for themselves, which is the purpose of your project in the first place. So could you comment on that a little bit, please? Well, again, I think that, um, as you know, uh, we work with countries uh, that have done extremely well, both in democratic and economic governance. This is all about partnership. You have to have partners that are committed to good democratic and economic governance. Okay? That's why we got engaged with uh, President Torrey previously, but you cannot get engaged with dictators that have absolutely no respect for good democratic governance. And it's unfortunate, yes, in the long term, uh, there's gonna be some consequences for the people of Mali, but you have to choose and pick the partners you wanna work with and the current regime is not the kind of government or the the government we want to work with. All right. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, ladies Good afternoon. and gentlemen. My name is Rosemary Seguero, President for Seguero's International Group. I want to thank you so much, Mr. Johannes, for lifting the compact for Malawi. I think lifting the compact of Malawi is a wonderful thing, and that's why I came here. You always see me here, but that was my main aim of coming. Now that we have another woman president, I think uh, the compact will be used very well, and uh, I'm so glad to say thank you so much, and uh, that's all I came to hear, and we look forward to working with you on the Malawi compact. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's the people of uh, Malawi and the president that we need to be very thankful for the efforts and the decisions uh, the president made in the last uh, 90 days. But glad to be there. 
Hello, Jennifer Brooklyn. I'm a reporter with DevEx, and I'm just wondering what conditions would need to be met or what would need to be in place in order, in your view, to reinstate the Mali Compact? The Mali Compact is going to be, uh, I mean, it had to be done, uh, uh, well, if, even before it was terminated, it was expected to be completed in September of this year. So it was six months away. So in our system, it must be completed within five years. There's no extension, right? Well, now it is terminated, and, and we are carefully uh, doing the wind-up activities. And it's going to be a very, very long time before Mali could be considered the candidate. I mean, I mean in, you know, incident that happened, it's not easy. Uh, that's why we, our model is based on selectivities. That's why we work with only about 24, 25 countries around the world. And um, it's not easy to be a partner of the Millennium Chilean Corporation, so it's going to take a very long time. They need to go back to, first of all, they need to, uh, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> adapt the Constitution or restore the Constitution that was uh, suspended and, uh, by the regime. So there's a lot of work that must be done. Yes. Uh, Salif Kamara, I work for Open Society Foundation and also a student at American University. I'm very concerned about the issue of Mali. Um, are we compromising with social need and politics? Uh, because you talked about uh, partnership. Uh, what about shifting to civil service, civil society? Instead of working with the government, why can't we still continue to serve the people? And ignore um, work with the civil society just to continue the, the work, the great work you guys are doing. I think Jonathan Bloom is going to talk about in, you know uh, what are the work that's being done uh, twined up. But again, I think that extremely very difficult uh, to work with dictators. I think some of the projects would not be completed, but it's going to be a reminder for the people of Mali that it happened because of some dictator that decided to overthrow a democratically elected government. That's not right. Right? That's the p price you pay when you do that. And I'm not happy about it because I've seen the progress. I, I saw what Mali needs, and it's not what we expected. And, and like Jonathan's going to be speaking, some, you know, for example, the terminal will not be complete. It's going to be boarded up. But that's going to be a reminder that when you have a coup d'etat and overthrow a government, that's the price you pay. It's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Anything? Chuck, it's yours. Thank you very much. Great to see you all. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chuck Cooper, and I'm the Vice President for Congressional and Public Affairs at the Millennium Challenge Corporation. We wanted to follow up on Daniel's uh, remarks with uh, going into a little bit more detail about the two subjects that were the primary focus of the board meeting. Um, uh, Jonathan Bloom, who is uh, joining us as uh, the Deputy Vice President for West Africa at MCC, is going to be talking to us about Mali. And Alicia Mandeville, who is with our Department of Policy and Evaluation as a director with uh, that department, will be talking with us about Malawi. And as Daniel said, um, it's, it's interesting that these two countries that we're going to be talking about today really do provide a stark contrast in democratic governance. And it's really uh, been dramatic over the last three months. We've seen tremendous progress and movement in the right direction in the case of Malawi. And in the case of Mali, uh, it has been very disappointing and, as Daniel said, sad and even tragic what's happened uh, in Mali over the last three months. But from an MCC perspective, one of the things that we're very much focused on, as Daniel had mentioned and was subject of, of some of the questions that were asked of him, is selectivity. And so I wanted to follow up with Alicia Mandeville uh, about that issue because it's so core to the MCC model. And I think it's really important to think through selectivity in the context of Malawi first and think about how is the MCC model being put into practice with regard to selectivity and why is it so important from the MCC perspective with regard to our ability to incentivize policy reform and good governance. So um, Alicia, can you talk a little bit about selectivity and why it's so important to MCC? 
Um, so uh, I think that, uh, as you heard the CEO mention quite a bit, selectivity is something that MCC thinks quite a bit, not just at the point in time in which we select compact or threshold partners, but throughout the course of that partnership with them. Um, to us, the partnership with the country is, um, uh, there's pieces on both sides of it. There's our commitment to the investment, our commitment to uphold the investments we'll make and to make them with technical assistance that's required. Um, but there's also the expectation that our partner remain committed to the level of policy performance and the sound policies that they showcased at the point in time that they were selected. Um, so when we're thinking about selecting country partners, um, we, uh, by law and by practice, uh, look at across multiple different policy areas. We rely on a publicly available scorecard. It r pulls data across 20 different indicators produced by third-party sources, so neither we nor the country in question can control the evaluation of policy in that country. Um, but it, it's an outstanding way to make a good visible comparison about policy performance. And uh, in order to be considered seriously by MCC, a country needs to do perform better than about than more than half of their peers within an income bracket across three areas. Uh, democratic governance, good democratic governance, investing in people, both health, education, and natural resource management, and also economic policy. So it's a really broad, even though we say we're very focused on being selective, we're selective across a broad base, if that makes sense, in terms of looking at policy performance really at a, as a comprehensive um, set. So I think once a country is selected to be compact eligible, though, um, we then, uh, we take very seriously the implications of that. So that means that we expect to have a partner that maintains that level of policy performance. Um, and then the difficult piece of that can be that MCC needs to uphold that standard as well. And so you hear us today talking about both the ability to reinstate Malawi, but also at a point in time, the need to have terminated the Mali Compact. Um, so I think this is an interesting conversation because it really throws into relief both sides of that conversation. Both what does it look like when a country demonstrates its ability to really hold up the policy performance and, and reverse it so that there's an improvement and then what happens when a country uh, reverses course and stops being able to uphold that performance. The development community talks about the MCC effect. Are the events that we've seen unfold in uh, Malawi over the last three months an example of that? And if so, how? I, I think that um, people are starting to point to that very strongly as an MCC effect. Um, and I should say up front that in, um, uh, and I think all of my colleagues at MCC will say that when uh, members of the current government of Malawi speak with us. They talk about the fact that these are reforms that they see as critical to the population of Malawi. These are the things that they, as, as a government, would undertake anyway. Um, but what we think has been really significant in the last, say, 60 to 90 days um, has really been the speed and, and energy focus behind some of those reforms. So for context, um, I think that there's kind of two pieces to the MCC effect if you break it down a little bit. There's the selectivity side, but there's also the transparency side. So it's not just that we say we have some concerns um, and then stop. Uh, MCC was very clear over the past year, this is what we're concerned about on the democratic governance side. And we talked about being concerned about changes in laws and institutions in Malawi. We talked about concerns about human rights violations. We talked about concerns around uh, the violent events of last July and police response to citizen protest. Um, and in the last 60 to 90 days, we've really seen the government take steps to address each and every one of those categories. And so I think that's what's probably most significant and demonstrable in this case, is that um, while uh, reform as part of a transition as a new leader comes in is often a natural step, um, the speed and the depth at which the government has really, I think, uh, tackled many of the areas that we were very uh, clear publicly we had concerns about um, really showed how much we understood them to be working towards not just making these changes but also showcasing to MCC that they were really committed to making sure we saw them as uh, able to uphold their uh, responsibilities as a compact partner. As you've said, we've seen really some courageous and bold actions being taken by President Banda and her government, it, but it's been three months since she's been inaugurated. How can you be sure that those, and how can you try to mm -hmm. incentivize continued progress, and how can you be sure that those reforms will continue, and how will MCC continue to monitor events on the ground in Malawi? Right. Um, I think this is something that I think a lot of people have asked. It's, it's been a short period of time. Um, what is it that you saw that gives, gives you confidence? And I think um, MCC is, uh, so I've been here for a little while. I've been here since 2006. Um, we can be accused of being somewhat plotting and methodical in our analysis. And um, we won't take an immediate signal or a trend and just go. We're often looking for the evidence that goes behind it, which is great in some camps and then very frustrating to other camps, I think. Um, 
and in this case, it's the that same kind of um, methodical look at how are the institutions being affected in Malawi? How is reform um, working in those institutions or through those institutions um, is really the core answer to this question. Um, in that it's, for example, um, I mentioned that we had expressed concern around the events of last July. Um, it was a situation in which multiple city protests were met with a police response that led to the deaths of some 19 people. Um, so in the immediate uh, post-presidential transition uh, to the Banda presidency, um, we saw a replacement of the new poli of a police inspector general and the appointment of someone who was known to be reform-oriented. Um, but really since then, seeing the fact that he has publicly called for an investigatory body inside the police to address, to investigate uh, human rights allegations or uh, allegations of human rights abuses, that he's publicly reversed a shoot to kill order that had been standing under the previous police inspector general. Um, and then he said that police will be subject to question, questioning as part of investigations into last year's events. Um, those are things that are tangible and institutionalizing. And so it's that kind of difference between it's not just the immediate signal, it's also the actions that you see that help build um, the positive reform into practice as opposed to just person. I think one of the earlier questions that was posed to Mr. Johannes was about this tension between focus on the beneficiaries, focus on the fact that our mission is to reduce poverty through economic growth, but then the principle, principle of selectivity. And so one thing that we see the board during the board meetings really grapple with is trying to balance between selectivity, making decisions about whether to suspend a compact or terminate a compact or reinstate or lift a suspension of a compact. They never take their eye off the beneficiary ball. And I think in the case of Malawi, one of the things that was so difficult was that this is such, we think this is such an important investment and it's going to benefit so many Malawians, yet we had to make the difficult decisions to suspend, but now happily are lifting that suspension. Can you talk a little bit about what the focus of the compact is with Malawi and what benefits we expect there to be for the people of Malawi as a result of this investment? I can give the general, I'll look to my colleagues from the operations team to cover it in more detail when people have questions, as they always do. <laughs> um, but in essence, I think Chuck's point that this, um, the structure and the design in this compact was something that MCC had been extraordinarily proud of as we went into compact signing. Um, as the CEO mentioned, it's concentrated in the power sector. Um, it was intended, it, as it, if implemented as designed, it integrates both capital investments in the uh, st structure and infrastructure required for the power sector, but also policy reform in terms of the regulation and the um, uh, go governance associated with the power sector. And that kind of integrated uh, investment was expected to generate something like $2 billion in benefits for, some for over 5 million Malawians. Um, and those numbers are particularly resonant in a country where the per capita income is less than a dollar per day. So this, the impact of the potential investment was something that we really talked a lot about as we went through the decision making process um, when things were getting worse. And it's been something that has been so pleasant to be able to come back to talking about now that we've seen a restoration of the commitment to democratic governance. Um, I think I would leave to um, the operations uh, to either Kay or Patrick uh, when we get to questions to talk in more detail about the okay. investment. Thanks, Alicia. Jonathan, we wanted to turn the conversation to Mali, which obviously is a difficult conversation and a, and a tragic situation as, it, as it, uh, events unfold. Can you talk a little bit about w what the events are right now in Mali? What, give us a, an update on the situation in Mali as of today. <laughs> Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Chuck. Um, as uh, the CEO mentioned, uh, the board uh, decided to terminate the compact by the end of August so that our charge has been to wind up the activities of the uh, compact in a responsible, orderly fashion. And we took that, uh, 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 devolved that into really three objectives. Uh, one is to secure the work sites to make sure we were leaving no hazard uh, behind. Two was to preserve the value of the uh, investments that have been made to date to preserve the value of the uh, taxpayer dollars. And three, in line with some of the questions that have been asked, was to protect the beneficiaries of the uh, investments and ensure they were no worse off uh, than before. So that the team went through um, the long list of probably um, on the order of a hundred and I'm looking for sure 150 contracts. Does that sound about right? 150. On on that order, and determined which 
could be, uh, uh, which should be simply canceled and brought to a sharp halt, and which needed to be continued for a limited period of time in order to achieve those, uh, those objectives. If you permit, I'd, I'd like to back up a step and just build on what Alicia was saying and what the, and the, the, the earlier questions. Um, uh, we share the distress uh, that's implicit in the questions. Um, we, and I, and I think uh, more, even more so, the uh, team in Mali, the MCA Mali team, uh, is, is greatly distressed by this turn of events. Um, the board does consider, as Alicia mentioned, the impact uh, on the beneficiaries of any suspension or termination uh, discussion. Um, and they also consider our ability to, to have an impact. Um, the criteria of selectivity of, of democratic governance, market-based economies, and investing in people are set not only because they are desirable in and of themselves, but because they've been found to be indicators, sorry, bad choice of word, indicia, collateral, uh, correlates of, of effective use of taxpayer dollars, of, of investment, uh, development investment dollars. So that since we have a limited pool of, of funds, we have to put them where they can be best used. Um, so much as that is unfortunate, and we share that, um, that, that is the charge. That's, that's, that's what we're here for. I would add one more point, that the, the, the Malians on the team, as distressed as they are, recognize this and respect the decision, just as they were so proud, as are in many countries, at being selected in the first place. They recognize that the flip side of that is when those, the, those terms are violated, that's, that is the cost. Can you um, go into a little bit more detail about where we are uh, on individual activities and sure. what we're trying to do from a wind-up uh, perspective and what the status of that is? Sure. Um, as, as the CEO mentioned, there are two, uh, two projects uh, within the compact. First, at the Bamako Airport, it really breaks down into yet two uh, major uh, activities. Uh, one is the re rehabilitation reconstruction of the principal runway and taxiways. Uh, that was uh, about two-thirds of the way along. Um, it was determined we could not leave it in the shape it was in. It was simply unsafe uh, for continuing operations and would have, uh, well, partly unsafe and partly would have degraded very quickly had we just left it. So we have uh, continued that contract and expect to finish that up to leave it in a safe operating condition. On the other hand, the terminal building uh, will not be finished. Uh, we determined uh, that it was best to, what we refer to as mothball it or, or wrap it up, uh, leave it so it does not present a hazard but is not, uh, is not functional. The other major project, the Alatoni Irrigation Project, most of the uh, works were pretty far along. Many of them were completed already. Uh, so as not to leave the beneficiaries worse off. We are uh, finishing the last few pieces of that. Um, we made a determination of a road, about an 80-kilometer access road, that about half of that could be finished to make it, make it usable. And on the other half, uh, we have engaged a contractor to make sure it is not left in an unsafe condition. Uh, the final piece is the distribution of just shy of 3,000 land titles, which was a critical policy reform as part of the uh, program. Um, those titles are being produced and are being distributed in a fashion to educate the people to what their rights are, where their property runs to, so as to solidify the uh, rights that they have gained. One of the other consequences of uh, the project has been notwithstanding the uh, turmoil in the area, the uh, families that have moved onto the, uh, on, onto the irrigated area are now substantially more, for, f excuse me, more food secure than they would have been otherwise. And 
than are many of the families in the area. So notwithstanding the turmoil, it has been a success already. You mentioned briefly that um, the response of MCA Mali and the, our counterparts in Mali with regard to the, the, um, the, the termination, the authorization of the termination. Can you talk a little bit more about that? What has been the response been of the, of the Malians that we're working with? Well, let me just reiterate in, in I guess, in three ways. Uh, one is the, the staff of MCA Mali is, as I've said, um, I think out of dedication to the program and trying to uh, uh, cushion the blow uh, on Mali are working exceedingly hard to maximize the benefits out of, even out of the termination. Second of all, uh, in the irrigation project area in the Alatona, um, as I mentioned, the, uh, the farmers recognize the benefits they're already gaining from it. Um, third, uh, there is on our website posted a letter that we received from one of the beneficiaries in the Alatona area uh, that, that uh, was, was unsolicited, I hasten to add, uh, which, which talks about the benefits of what was done, but I think equally much how it was done. Let me just read the first paragraph from it because I think it, it, it responds a lot to Chuck's question. Uh, the, 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 the letter starts off, thank you, MCA Molly. When considering effort, perseverance, and keeping one's word, quality work is better than talk. There is currently a large American organization helping Molly to put an end to poverty, difficulty, and suffering in a place called Alatona. Every strong person give your best effort. Every weak person give your best effort. As for MCA Mali, they have completed what was in their power to do. May God assist us. So I think it's a recognition of what, I like the phrase, what was in their power to do. And it's got to be a difficult situation for the MCA Mali staff to have to be in a situation where they have to complete the compact under a circumstance of termination, or not complete the compact, but wind up the compact under a termination. What's their reaction been? Well, their reaction has been, as I mentioned, to 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 work even harder uh, within the limits that that, that we've posed. Um, I think it's also a d uh, good demonstration of how both the working relationship has improved over the uh, five years or so, um, but also how they've come together to work as an even more effective team, uh, probably one of the most effective teams working in Mali today, um, working with our frequently uh, painstaking procedures, shall we say. And from a budget perspective, how much money is being spent to wind up the compact? Um, out of the uh, 460, 461 million, uh, we expect to stay within a budget that's been set for us of not exceeding 436 million, uh, of which um, something north of 400 has already been dispersed. So you anticipate that there may be cost savings as a result of the, of the termination. There may be some money left over at the end. We do expect there will be some money left over, yes. Okay, all right. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, we want to open up the questions to you, so at this point we will maybe do 15 or 20 minutes of questions if you have them, um, and we'd be happy to answer your questions starting right here. Hi, excuse me, Penelope Hucker from ACDI VOCA. Um, as you know, ACDI VOCA is uh, one of the contractors still working in Mali with MCA Mali, and um, we are happy to see that most of the agricultural related activities will be able to finish. Um, but one of the questions that we've grappled with internally with our team um, in the field as well as here is um, the capacity building and the activities afterwards with the large U.S. government investment being made through this compact with Mali. Um, I know some discussions have gone on with USAID, um, but we're looking at, you know, 
what sort of additional capacity building is being envisioned afterwards. Uh, we definitely understand the transparency and the democracy related issues and why the compact needed to end early. But as a large $436 million investment has been made, um, I'm curious to see kind of the way forward and if the US government in another fashion, shall we say, with USAID or some other entity uh, will be looking at additional assistance. I think there, there are two aspects to that. Um, whether there had been a coup, even if there had not been a coup, MCC's program would have terminated on September 16th or 17th, I forget. So there would have been an end to that regardless. Um, it's the nature of MCC that, that we have this five-year limit, which uh, encourages discipline and rigor in getting things uh, uh, um, uh, exec uh, implemented. We had planned uh, a series of capacity-building activities so as to leave the farmer organizations and the water user associations um, in a uh, condition to manage the investments. Um, I believe a good part of that has already been accomplished. Um, there are some small bits of it just uh, being finished up. Um, but we will not be able to get as much done as we had hoped. Um, that, that will not uh, be able to happen. Um, there have been some discussions with, there had been and have been some discussions with USAID as to whether or not they'll be able to take those over. I think that depends a lot on their ability to continue to operate in that area, which is not at all clear. Um, so at this point, I'd have to say it's uncertain um, whether that those will be able to continue. Other questions? Sarah Jane? Uh, Sarah Jane Stats with the Center for Global Development and shifting gears back to Malawi. I think everyone would agree that there's uh, lots to be impressed with with the new president and the speed with which she's made the reforms. But as Chuck mentioned, it's only been three months. Uh, so I'm wondering why now as opposed to waiting a few more months and why MCC as opposed to other U.S. tools? Um, thank you. Um, I think that uh, Going back to kind of the original point that at the time Malawi was suspended, we were really transparent about what we were worried about. Um, and we were transparent domestically, and we were transparent with the government of Malawi, and we were transparent in the open Malawian media as well. Um, and so as a result, I think there was a pretty good understanding across the board of what kinds of things MCC was looking for in order to be able to say our confidence in Malawi's ability to be a good compact partner has been restored. And as um, as a short amount of time passed and we saw a larger and larger number and then all of those things. Um, I think the uh, consensus grew increasingly around the point that if you've been very public about what you expect to see to have your confidence restored, if you see bold and sometimes politically difficult decisions taken in an effort to restore that confidence, then you should act once you have that in place. Um, and so um, would more time show us more? Definitely. Um, but I think that it was the board's decision and the CEO's recommendation that at this point we have seen a sufficient amount that we should feel confident that this uh, government is moving reform in the right direction, and so therefore we'll be able to be a good MCC partner. Um, and so the timing, there was a lot of discussion around that, but I think that it, the conclusion was generally one should act when one sees what's needed to restore confidence. I have a question regarding the mechanics of the reinstatement. In particular, MCC let out a task order on the oversight of that compact, I think three weeks before the actual suspension. Do you anticipate reverting back to that task order or are you going to reissue, are you going to issue a new task order? Do you have, have you decided what to do about that? I'll be honest, my, uh, 
ability to speak to specific task orders is extraordinarily limited to about zero. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> uh, but I do, I will say that I know that as uh, our compact teams and our operations team move towards um, moving into an implementation or moving towards EIF, there are a number of steps they have to put in place. Um, and so I, there will be a, t they're in the process of assembling a technical mission to determine what are the appropriate immediate next steps for us. Um, and so uh, if there's more we could add specifically, we can, but I think uh, because the reinstatement decision happened just uh, some number of hours ago, no. <laughs> uh, some uh, just a few days ago, we're still in the process of identifying the exact next steps. <laughs> just in case. <laughs> yes. Hello, I'm David Baxter with Jacobs. In your handout, you've made a statement that immediate steps following reinstatement include a thorough reassessment of the scope and the cost of the project or the compact. Can you share some of that with us? Um, so the reassessment will be uh, the mission of this technical delegation. Um, and my understanding is that they're expected to go at some point, as soon as possible, but likely in July, since we're quickly approaching the end of June. Um, uh, in essence, the MCC investment compact in Malawi uh, sat on a shelf, more or less, for about a year. Um, and so it, as part of appropriate due diligence, we have to go and uh, assess what are the, are there ch changes to the cost structure? Are there changes to some of the technical specifications? Are there new adjustments that we would need to make? Um, not to the major substance of the investment, but to the um, technical details that allow uh, most appropriate implementation. So. As I said, that mission would go out within the net within the month. I think uh, is within the month, um, but we haven't actually had it yet, so we can't speak to the details. Hi, Mike Schoag from Forum One Communications. Um, with regards to the airport, uh, is it being used now, and are there expectations that the government will finish it itself? Has it indicated what's going to happen with it, and uh, just? What do you think might happen with the airport? The, um, <coughs> the airport is being used now. Actually, it's, it's one of the principal difficulties with finishing off the runway uh, because the uh, airport needs to be closed down for 72 hours at a time to get a lot of work done. And it's been, um, uh, it's been difficult scheduling around that. Um, so some of the... Uh, uh, regional and international carriers are still operating, although with, with less traffic. Um, we, um, at, at, at the moment, we've seen no indication the government, w sort of depending on which government we're talking about, um, but uh, we've seen no indication that they will pick it up um, so that for us the responsible thing to do is to wind it up and leave it in a, uh, as safe a condition as possible. Other questions? Thank you. Hi, my name is Lauren Wygonski from Nexit. And just regarding Malawi, do you, you said that the technical and cost will be reassessed. Will the timeline be reassessed also in terms of implementation? By law, we're required to implement on five year in, in a five-year time frame. Um, there is usually a period of about uh, nine to 12 months before our compacts move from uh, kind of initial startup to what we call entry into force. At that entry into force point, the five-year clock starts. And there's not, we have no capacity to renegotiate that. Yeah, sorry, but to be uh, clear, entry into force had not happened yet. Uh, so we haven't hit that five-year clock. It hasn't started yet. It will start in the future. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. We appreciate you coming today. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Jonathan. Have a good afternoon.